Hey everybody, welcome to week 13. So this week I thought we'd uh, spend the hour talking about creating animated visuals and doing some basic drawing and sort of lines and shapes and things in Super Collider. Uh, it's not something people do with Super Collider too often, and I guess I just wanted to start with a kind of a disclaimer, which is that uh, I feel pretty confident saying that Super Collider is not optimized for doing visuals in the way that, um, you know, uh, image and video specific platforms are, like Adobe products and um, BDMX, Isadora, processing, jitter, you know, stuff like that. It's uh, pretty easy to overwhelm your computer CPU when you do a lot of animation and stuff in Super Collider. But it's still pretty possible, and there's a pretty uh, developed set of tools for drawing and creating shapes and animating them in Super Collider. So let's get started. I think the um, the end goal for today is we'll make uh, uh, a basic real-time analyzer. So like drawing something which is audio reactive and shows the real-time spectrum of a sound that's playing on the server. Um, but before we boot the server, we're just going to get a basic canvas here. So it starts with a window. So uh, I think it's tutorial 14 uh, in the main tutorial series, which is about GUI. So that covers like making a window and knobs and sliders and things like that, um, at least sort of a basic way of working with it. And uh, also in 2017, I did a, a lecture in this class, um, which was uh, Kind of, kind of the same stuff. Just you can see, I got a window over here, and I'm drawing some shapes, and it's just a, just a still image. But um, uh, anyway, it's um, you can check that out as well for another lecture on this kind of stuff. So, um, window takes a couple of arguments. The first is uh, the string to appear in the title bar, uh, and then uh, bounds, which is where on your screen this um, window is going to exist, and I planned ahead, and uh, so I've got a rect instance here. So it's uh, 1,400 pixels from the left edge, 500 pixels from the bottom, and then it's 500 by 500. So I could stop here and say dot .front, and there we go. And we have a, a little window here. Um, uh, a couple of other... Well, um, first of all, I like to make this window always on top. Um, and I, I like to begin with window.closeAll. So that way I can just run this code. Uh, I need to get rid of this semicolon here because I'm, I'm basically stringing together these methods one after the other. Um, but I, I just, for style, I like to put them on separate lines. So this way when we run this code, we close any windows that might be open. Uh, we create a new window, make it always on top, and front it which makes it visible and frontmost. So now I can go back to my code and the window is still visible. So that's nice. Um, and if we want to do kind of drawing and animation stuff, the, one of the best ways to do that is by creating a user view. And user view needs to know its parent view, which in this case is the view of the window. I think you can just say W here, W, because that's the name of our window, or W.view, and then the bounds. Uh, and we can say, uh, you know, W.bounds, and that gives us the bounds of the window on the screen, but that's not really what we want. We want the uh, bounds of the view, the, the basic view on the window, which is this rectangular space here. Uh, and that gives us a slightly different rect, which is uh, with respect to the upper left corner, so 0, 0 from the left and the top, and then 500 wide and 500 tall. So we'll just put this right here. And uh, if we leave it here, I don't think this will look any different, um, even though there is, in fact, a user view. Uh, we just It's just, I think the default background color is completely transparent, so we can say... Uh, background um, color dot rand 
uh, yeah, so if we run this again and again, we'll get a new random color each time. So this isn't particularly interesting. And in fact, I'm going to say gray. Uh, and then uh, the first value is um, basically, a, a, I think 0 is fully black, 0 is fully white. Um, so we make that 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. You can see it's different shades of gray, right? So I'm going to make it 0 0.1. The second value is a transparency value. Um, this is just a little tangent here. Why not? So we're going to make, uh, if we say w.view.background color.clear, this is just a quick way of making a fully, tra oh, um, well, sorry, we're not going to run that. We're just going to run the whole thing. So here it's, um, the, the Windows view is totally transparent, but the user view is totally opaque. So we can kind of um, ease off on some of the opacity a little bit. And... Uh, is this working? I don't think it is. View. Maybe it's W dot background. <laughs> I had this working earlier. This is a kind of a pointless. There is a way. There is a way to make the window like see through. Um, but um, I didn't take notes <laughs> of this because I thought it was not necessary. All right, but anyway, we, what we want is a user view, which is uh, dark, like this. And then we can draw on it. Uh, user view is a special kind of, uh, you know, view, basically just a, a sort of a canvas style object, which responds to a few unique messages like... Um, uh, animate uh, and uh, frame rate and stuff. So uh, usually it begins by uh, setting the draw func of the user view to be some function. And this function is evaluated whenever the view is refreshed. And that happens when it's created or if you explicitly say refresh using the refresh method. And how do we draw? Well, we use a class called pen, and my help files are kind of obscured here, so I'm going to detach them. Uh, so pen is a is an object that is it's the object we use for drawing on uh, on user views, and pen is kind of an unusual class in that you do not create instances of pen. Uh, you you never say pen dot new or anything like that. Instead, pen is like a a singleton class. So it's just one object. It's a singular object that you can think of it as like a you know, sort of a pen that's just like the, the great glorious pen in the sky. And we just send messages to the pen class directly, which say things like make a line from here to here, make an arc from here to here, uh, you know, fill in the lines, change the color, change the pen width, stuff like that. So we'll do something real simple to start with. And we'll say um, pen dot line and so line needs two points um, and we'll say point 100 comma 100 and point uh, 200 comma 300 and these are in pixels with respect to the upper left corner uh, and this won't do anything <laughs> because uh, establishing the line is not the same thing as actually drawing the line rendering the line so for that we need to we probably ought to uh, give the pen a color. Stroke, so there's there's strokes, which are basically creating lines and curves. And then there's also a fill color. When you close a shape, you can color the inside of it. So we're going to set the stroke color to be um, blue. Set the width to be four pixels. And even this isn't enough. We need to actually say pen.stroke. And this will actually render all of the strokeable lines and curves and, and things we've established. So this, this should make a line. And it does. And I don't really like the contrast. So I'm going to change the color. And I'm going to do um, a new color uh, specifying RGB values, which are ranging from um, 0 to 1. And what I like to do here is sometimes bring up a little 
a color swatch. I'm actually just using text edit for this because there's I don't think there's a built-in color swatch in, in Super Collider. But um, you can sort of pick your color here. And um, like I, I'm thinking something no red, half green, all blue, which is like halfway between, I guess, blue and cyan. Um, and these are 255 values. So you can say 255, new 255, uh, 0, 127, 255. And that'll give you that color. Or if you just want to, you know, you can just do it this way too. This is fine. Same thing. 0 0.51 RGB. All right, so we made a line. Uh, and if we change this to 400, yep, then it's, well, let's go back to 100 for a second just for. So this point here is 100 in, 100 down. And this point here is 200 in, 300 down. So that's how we render our points. And there's a nice syntax shortcut for points, which is using the at symbol. So you can say 100 out of 100 and 200 at 300. And so we can shift over the x coordinate of the first point by 300 pixels. Um, right. Make a vertical line. It's kind of the idea. And uh, this uh, is a completely deterministic draw func. Right? If we just leave it alone, it's going to be exactly the same every time. Um, uh, which is kind of boring. So I mean, we could say something like u dot uh, animate, true, and it's actually animating it. It's it's uh, evaluating this draw func some number of times per second. I think the default frame rate is sixty, but you can change that. Uh, but it's not doing anything because it's the same exact same image every frame. So we're gonna turn off animation, and uh, we'll make a, a dynamic example. So instead of something which is completely deterministic, we're going to say, give me a random value between 100 and 400 for the x coordinate of the first point. And if we run this again and again and again, it picks a new value every time. And so now at this point, we can say u.animate. And uh, It'll go. It's pretty cool. I guess here. So we got a little animating line, just kind of wiggling around, which is fine. Uh, um, U dot uh, frame rate. You can slow it down: twenty frames per second, ten frames per second four frames per second. Um, and there's a cap somewhere. I mean, your computer cannot refresh its screen, you know, a million times a second. It's just so you can you can set it higher, but at a certain point, you're just not going to see any any difference whatsoever. So I, I usually just go to 30, which I feel like is a nice, reasonable frame rate where things, you know, look pretty good, I guess. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So that's a, that's a basic, um, animated example here. And I feel like there's something I wanted to, oh yeah. Well, okay. So another thing we can do with this window is, I mean, like maybe we don't want this, um, menu bar here or the, the title bar. So window takes a couple of other things, uh, resizable. Let's make that false. So we won't be able to do stuff like this, and also whether it has a border. False. I'll also make that false. So now, uh, if we, I'll run this code and you'll see it'll it'll look pretty much the same, but the the thing will be gone from the, the menu, the title bar will be gone. Right? So now it's just a plain rectangle, which is not really interactable with the mouse or anything. And to actually get it to close, we need to say w.close or window.closeAll. But I think this looks a little bit nicer. And I also realize we can't see some of the post window, but since it's nice and full, it'll be down here at the bottom. So that seems fine. All right. Um, so um, 
uh, uh, making one line is, is pretty easy, but making like, you know, a bunch of lines, you might think, wow, that's going to be super tedious, right? Like, we, do we need to do like some nonsense like this? I mean, as soon as, as soon as you find yourself looking at code that looks like this, you should think one thing and one thing only, and that is iteration. Um, so depending on what you want to draw, like if I want to draw 64 lines or something, I can use iteration to do that. And I'm going to kind of, I have, I have code I can copy and paste, but I want to step through the process because I think that's kind of interesting. So uh, in the draw func, we're going to say 64.do and pass in an argument which represents the, the numbers 0 through 63. And that's going to be the same. That's going to be the same. Here's where the magic needs to happen. And then that's going to be the same. Right? So uh, we can say, uh, so what we want to do here is make, I'm going to, I'm going to make 64 lines, little vertical lines, all in a row. Um, uh, and so the, you know, it's going to be, it's going to look like uh, something at something. We'll, we'll start at like, um, uh, I don't know, 100 at 300, and this will go to 100 at 150. So if I do this, um, what it's going to do is make 64 lines that are exactly the same directly on top of each other. And, you know, so it, it just made 64 lines, and each one is drawn over the one before it. So we need to use this iteration counter, n, to basically shift this x value over as we go. So I'm going to make a variable called x and set it equal to um, uh, 60 plus n times 6. And I'm, I'm doing this, I'm, so I want to start at least 60 pixels in. I mean, I'm just kind of arbitrarily picking this. And then each time it goes through this do, it's going to say 60 plus 0 times 6, 60 plus 1 times 6, 60 plus 2 times So it's going to be 60, 66, 72, 78, etc. And uh, it's jumping by six pixels and drawing a line which is four pixels wide at that starting point. So it's going to be like a four pixels of line, two pixel break, four pixels of line, two pixel break. And then we just got to plug in x down here, x at 300, x at 150. And it failed. I need a semicolon on line 67. That was my problem. Aha! That looks good. I mean, let's make them a little shorter. So x300 to x200. And what if we want to make them not all the same color? OK, we could do something wacky like this. That's cute. Um, but if we want to do something a little bit more deterministic, maybe a little bit more designy, I don't know, uh, we can also incorporate the iteration count into this, into the color number. So instead of just 0.5 for the green value on each one, we'll say n.linlin. .lin. So we're going to map this from 0 to 0.63 onto 0.4 to 0.7. So the ones on the left will be a little bit closer to blue, and the ones on the right will be a little bit closer to cyan. And this is hopefully going to look kind of nice. Yeah, so we get a little gradient going on. All right, so still not animating anything. We can animate this, but it's, again, it's deterministic. Doesn't do anything. I mean, it's it's working, but it's just drawing the exact same thing every time. <coughs> so the first thing I thought to do here, before we jump right into a real-time analyzer, is to make uh, a sine wave, like make this thing, you know, have have each one of these uh, lines go up and down sinusoidally, but in phase with each other, so that it actually looks like a propagating sine wave. Uh, so the first thing I did was I, um, I did a little bit of trigonometry. Um, and I'm going to see if I can recreate this without copying it from my notes here. Uh, so I think I made another variable called t. And t is just going to be the input to some sine function, like sine of t. And t is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Because if we want to do a cyclic thing with sine waves, we're going to have to have some value that goes from 0 to 2 pi. So I think I said t equals n dot lin lin 0, 64, 
0, 2 pi. And I know that this iteration count only goes up to 63. So why am I including 64? Well, it's because uh, our um, you know, trigonometric input also doesn't ever really reach 2 pi. It just goes from 0 uh, up to and just shy of 2 pi. So 63 will give us a value just a little bit below 2 pi, and then 64 should give us 2 pi or, or 0. So we wrap back around, basically. Um, OK, and so then uh, the y value is what's going to be sinusoidally manipulated here. So we're going to say sine of t. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're taking the sine of some value that starts at 0 and ends up just before 2 pi, which is going to give us a, a sine curve. But the values are going to be from negative 1 to positive 1, because that's the normal trigonometric output. So we should map those as well onto suitable values here. Um, and so we started at 200, so we'll say the bottom one will actually go up to 150. And, no, let's do 250 and 150. Right? So it's going to draw 64 lines. The x coordinates are just shifting over by six pixels each time, and the y value for the, the, of the, the top pixel, right? It draws the bottom one first and then draws a line from the bottom to the top. And that top value is going to be sinusoidally ranging from 250 to 150. No, semicolon. I always forget my semicolons. There we go. And if we were to switch 250 and 150, that would just kind of invert the invert the shape, I think. Yeah. So I just wanted to, um, you know, this is a consequence of the fact that super collider counts from the top. So like larger values are actually lower on the uh, user view. So that's why I did the big value first and the little value second. So we got a sine wave. It's still not going to animate. So there's one last step. We just need to, I mean, what we need is for this t value to undergo uh, you know, a phase, a phase shift every time a frame goes by. Um, so we, we get a, a frame, and we need to take this t value and basically shift it by 1 64th of a cycle or something along those lines. So that next time it draws it, it actually starts with this line, right? and then it starts with the third line and the fourth line. And then once we animate that, it'll actually look like a propagating sine wave. So let's see if I can replicate this here. Uh, what we want is some global counter, something to keep track of you know, what frame we're on or how many, how many frames have advanced. Uh, and I think what we want to do is just say t plus count. And then at the end, and this is this is subtle here, but we don't want to put that here because the counter then is going to get incremented uh, 64 times per frame, right? It gets incremented between the drawing of each line, um, which is not what we want. We want to draw all 64 lines and then increment the counter. And, it, and it's not going to be plus 1. I don't think this is going to be quite right. Uh, like, if we animate this now, it's, it's really fast. I mean, it's working. That's cool. But it's like, this is a relatively large amount of phase shift. It's supposed to be like, um, I mean, we can increment it by whatever we want, you know. If you're trying to like sync it up with something, then you might have to do some clever math. But I think we can just say uh, add 1 over 64. It's probably 2 pi over 64 or something. Um, is this going to work? Yeah, that seems right. Yeah, OK. So we've got a little uh, animated sine wave here. And. Um, we can just turn it on and off, the animation. We can uh, slow it down. And I wonder how fast we can make it go. I mean, like, that doesn't seem any different from 30 frames per second. I think 30 is a good starting point here. So what I like, I like this. It looks kind of cool because you can look at it as a bunch of sine, you know, hills moving to the left. But if you, you can kind of focus on one individual bar, and then it kind of has a very kind of clear
clear up and down motion to it. So it's it's nice to look at. <laughs> All right. So we have a little um, animated sine wave going on here. And let's check on my notes here. All right. So I think we're just about ready. Uh, and, and at this point, you probably can imagine lots of variations on this. Like we're not doing anything with the bottom, with the Y coordinate of the bottom points on each of these lines. Those are fixed at 300. So I, I don't know. I'm just going to try something here. Uh, this is going to look weird, I think. Ooh, <laughs> it's like dripping. Ooh, cool. <laughs> uh, fun. All right. So that's an idea. And it's just it's just kind of it, you can't really mess anything up. Um so you can you know, just change any of these numbers and something will happen most likely. Um uh yeah, so it's okay. Let's I think we're let's let's move on to sound. And let's we're going to we're going to make a real-time analyzer and so we're going to be connecting reconnecting with some FFT ideas here. So to start, we'll make a sound function. We're not using X, right? No. Okay. We'll make some pink noise. Uh, and we'll put it through, put it through a band fast filter. I want to make something which is going to be very visibly visually obvious. So we're going to um. Sweep a sine osc. We're going to start at the lowest part of the, so it starts at the bottom, going from, let's say, 200 to 18,000, real high. And the quality will be, I don't know, the reciprocal quality will be 0.3, and we'll just 0.2, and we'll just amp it up a little bit because it's going to get quieter because we're removing so much of the energy from the bandpass filter. Um, all right, so this should make sound. Okay, so we have some, uh, some sound. And uh, what I want to do here's here's the idea I had. Yeah, we could like um, it would be tricky to do this in the time domain, sort of avoiding FFT stuff. If we wanted to actually r render, you know, like make this look like a spectral real time analyzer, um, what we'd have to do is just like run this signal, you know, sig through like a dozen two dozen, three dozen bandpass filters, and then track the amplitude of each one. It would just get kind of messy. It's a lot of work. Uh, I think the FFT library will make this a little bit easier. So we're going to revisit some of those ideas. A little recap here. Um, so we need local buff. And uh, here's where knowledge of Fourier stuff comes in handy. So um, we've got 64 bars here. And we're thinking of this one as like, you know, zero or the lowest bin or whatever, and this one as the Nyquist frequency. And when we take an FFT, we actually get um, uh, bins representing zero all the way to the sampling rate. And we don't really care about the upper half because those are just a mirror image of the, um, the lower half, but we still should be taking the full FFT. So if we make this 128, it's kind of low for like doing FFT sound stuff like it's a really low really small analysis size it's going to be coarse but because we're just doing visuals here it doesn't really matter and in fact if i were to do something huge like actually draw out 8192 or even 4096 lines i think we'd start to see my computer really start struggling so we're gonna go we're gonna go low here so 128 bins we're gonna only be using the first half and the input so we take an fft and at some point at the end, we're going to take the inverse Fourier. And so this should sound exactly the same.
and it does. So, in actually, we don't even need we don't even need this um this window right now. Let's just focus on the sound. Close that. Not think about it. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna use uh, PV collect. So PV collect. Let's remember what that is. Uh, we're gonna collect over all 128 bins, and what we have the option of messing with the magnitudes and phases to change the spectrum, but we don't actually want to do that. We just want to collect over uh, the bins so that we can capture that data and put it somewhere so that it can be used by the uh, user view. And I'm just trying to make sure I don't... Actually, I'll just check my notes here, but yeah, PV collect. Uh, like, do we say chain equals chain dot PV collect? I think we do. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna do all 128 uh, bins. Uh, mag phase bin index. I think these are the arguments we pass into it. Not entirely sure how bin is different from index. They might be the same thing. Um, but uh, we're gonna output mag phase. Um, what we're going to do inside of this PV collect is uh, out.kr, right? We're going to we're going to write these data to 128 control buses, or actually we uh, well we'll see, but um, we're going to say index mag. We don't really care about phases right now. We just we're going to write the magnitude data to uh, an, a control bus with an index corresponding to the bin number. And um, and then PV collect also lets you say which bins would you specifically like to process. And I would only like to process 1 to 64 because the zeroth bin represents 0 hertz. So it's basically checking for DC offset. And I know, you know, it's, who cares? I don't want, I don't care about that. So we're going to start at bin one and I believe, so we can just take sample rate divided by FFT frame size and that gives us the fundamental frequency, um, so to speak, of the first bin. So I think that this first one's about 375 hertz. The next one will be twice that. The next one will be three times, uh, you know, three times, four times, etc. All the way up to the 64th bin, which should be the Nyquist frequency. Um, and this is it's good. This is good because it, it basically cuts the processing load in half uh, because we don't actually care about the upper half, so we're just going to do bins one through sixty-four. Uh, okay. So yeah, we're not actually manipulating the data. We're just using this PV collect to write the data to sixty-four control buses. And I think it's only doing sixty-four because because these the bins outside of this range are not being processed it's not going to bother doing anything with them. So I think it's just 64 control buses. All right, so first of all, let's just make sure it plays. And now what I want to do is look at the control buses on the scope. And I want to look at 64 of them. OK, so. Uh, Here's something you might have never seen before. Exception in graph def receive exceeded number of interconnect buffers. This uh, this shows up if you have really complex synth defs, like lots of multi-channel expansion being applied to lots of multi-channel expansion. And uh, interconnect buffers or wire buffers are internal things that you don't deal with directly but are necessary for interconnecting unit generators. So I think all we need to do here is say s.options dot num wire buffs and the default here is 64 so I'm just gonna YOLO in some 512 here I I don't actually know how many it needs it doesn't tell me but hopefully this is enough and it's just when we when we try to render 64 uh, scope views in one window. I think it's just what it needs to do behind the scenes is interconnect a bunch of stuff and it just doesn't have the the necessary space to do that. 
So let's try it again. So cool, right? How cool is this? I mean, that by itself is is a pretty cool looking animation, but we can see it's like that's we're just writing the magnitude data to these control buses. And then we, you know, we could have another synth def somewhere reading, reading any of those using in.kr. Um, and uh, so we're, what we're going to also do here is um, grab some buses on the language side. So clear the bus count. And I don't really know of a super good way to do this. But I don't want bus zero, so I'm just gonna allocate it, uh, but not actually save it. And then I'm gonna say b equals bus dot control s sixty four. And so what this does is it clears the bus count, grabs one control bus, and then grabs the next sixty four. So this one starts at one, and there's sixty four total. And I think these are the actual buses we want to use for rendering the user view data. Uh, OK, so um, and, and then now we can say something like, oh, actually, let's here's, if we want to actually read the control data, like we can't read data from an audio bus easily in the language, but we can read data from control buses easily. So let me play this again and then stop it. That and so the data is you know it was on the process it was it's somewhere around I don't know two thousand hertz or something so we can just visually see there's data here and if we say b dot get n synchronous it gives us an array of the values on all sixty four buses uh, and and there's Control buses are, are very handy. I, I really ought to do a tutorial on using them because you can just set values of control buses from the language without any sort of funny business. And so they're they're more more flexible, I think, than audio buses. So there's um yeah, get synchronous, get n synchronous for a block of buses. You can set synchronous. Um, so bus help file, worth reading at some point. It can really come in handy, I think. Okay, so we're we're getting closer. We now have a means of just retrieving the values, the magnitude values from the FFT in real time from these sixty-four control buses. Um, uh, so now, I think we're just about ready to modify our uh, user view code. So we'll take this, bring it down here. And all right, so we don't need any of this trigonometric stuff. So forget the counter. That's kind of useless at this point. And um, we don't need this. That's also trigonometric. We're done with our sine waves. Uh, so here's our iteration counter. Our x position for the lines is not going to change. We're still just drawing 64 lines starting at pixel 60 and all the way up to the end. So this is what needs to change here. So I think all we need to do here is b dot get n synchronous, right? And that gives us an array, right, of sixty-four values. So we need to say at n, and so that's going to be some pretty small value because if we just look at these values, it's like sub pixel. You know, some of them are above one, some of them are above two, but most of them are like 0, 0.0, whatever, whatever. Um, so I'm going to arbitrarily multiply them by some number. I mean, it, we're just drawing here, so it's not like it's going to blow up in our ears. We're just manipulating pixels here, not, not samples. Um, that can stay the same. That looks right. And... Yeah, let's let's try it. So we'll um, reset these buses. Not that we need to start our sound. 
create this. It looks okay, I think. We just have to animate it now. You know what I need to do? Uh, this is not, this, here's where my math is wrong. Uh, so th this is some, some magnitude value, which I'm scaling up by 20, but that should not be the raw pixel value. That's my mistake. What I need to do here is 300 uh, minus that value. All right, so I, this, because instead it was doing like a band reject filter, but I need to take the starting pixel value, subtract a certain amount. Um, the bigger it is, the more we want to subtract and the taller the line will get. So this, that looks, that already looks much better. Um, so let's just play it again. And animate. And what's cool about this is that we can change the draw funk in real time. Like that's totally fine. Let's just make these twice as tall, like this. Oh, that looks nice. Pretty cool. Um, let's swap different color. Uh, actually, let's extract this. Um, yeah, I think I already this. And what I meant to do was and then zero and one. Ah, different color. I could even do uh, do this again. Colored out round. So every frame, random color for every every one of them. Let's go back to what we had. Make it uh, thinner. We'll taller again. How about that, right? Not bad. Yeah, not exactly sure why it doesn't fade out with the sound. I think it's just kind of a nuance of the FFT calculation and the Fourier coefficients that are being used. Like, even if the sound is really quiet, it, you know, I don't even know. Uh, but we, we can, you know, we could finesse that. We could also, um, uh, I don't know if we're going to do anything right now, but we could also just modify the draw funk so that uh, it's simultaneous. I don't know. There's probably some clever way to do it, but I don't really, I don't really care about that right now. What I thought might be fun is just, just for, just for laughs, kind of do uh, two, two new, two different audio files. Because at this point, it's very easy to just substitute a different, um, a different sound source. Um, you know, for our pink noise. I just the pink noise is nice because it very clearly shows that it's working. Um, so we've got a couple of sound files here. Uh, this one is, uh, just a beat that I pulled from the Logic Pro Loops, uh, library. And I know it's only in one ear, you know, but, uh, doesn't really matter. We can multi-channel expand that. This is me talking about delays. But that's okay. We can make it sound different by... So, um, let's make our new, make our window. It's the control bus data is persistent, right? It just hangs out there because nothing's telling it to change. Uh, copy this. Drop it down here. Um.
Maybe I should, I don't know, just do those in separate steps. And uh, just do me talking right here. And let's put this in here. But that's okay. We can make it sound different by adding an effect. Let's add a delay because that's a fairly standard and fun thing to do, especially with voice. So first let's declare a spec. Yeah, so that's basically it. I mean, it's uh, something I've thought about doing for a while just to see how easy it would be to make a simple real-time analyzer. Uh, I'm, I, there's so so many methods uh, for user, not, not so much user view, but for pen in particular, which um, are just, uh, it, it's one of the longer help files. It's really quite long, but if you search for, um, well, just, just to give you a taste here. So there's, you know, uh, line two, so the, the pen always has a current position, and then you draw a line from the current position to a new point, and then the pen's current position moves along with it. You can just draw a line from between two arbitrary points, curve, uh, quadratic, I assume that means quadratic curve, arc. The arcs are just basically, you know, ch parts of a segment of a circle or an ellipse. Goes on and on and on and on. Um, uh, Search for animation. There's a bunch of uh, code examples which you can study. These are a little bit different. I don't know when this was written. I assume quite a long time ago. But it's not even using a user view. It's just drawing directly on the the view of the window, which is totally allowed. It's just I don't think you have as much control over like frame rate and stuff like that. But you know, you can get pretty sophisticated. Uh, I also, just for fun, I, here's another example. Um, I had a dream one night uh, about a rotating cube that was in Super Collider. And then I woke up and I was like, I'm going to code that. And it looks like this. And so I'll, I'll put this um, in, the, in the week lecture folder as well so you can study this. But basically, I'm thinking about this as eight vertices. Right, the top four, bottom four. And the draw func here basically just draws lines appropriately between vertices. And then I'm thinking of each of those eight vertices as rotating around a circle with um with a quarter cycle offset for each set of four. So like, you know, this uh it's just uh uh you know, it's like X plus pi, x plus pi over 2, x minus pi over 2. And then I'm just mapping the trigonometric values onto appropriate pixel values. And so it just, I didn't do anything with linear perspective because my brain started to hurt. Um, that seems like it might be more challenging. But, you know, it's a rotating cube. And I also made a little twisty version. So one, the top spins faster than the bottom. So it does a cool twisty thing. <laughs> So this is maybe something some of you might be interested in studying as well. Um, so I would recommend that uh, if you want to get into all of this animation stuff, you check out the examples in the pen help file in particular. I think the pen help file has lots of examples, and each, each one of these methods has a little example with it. So you can really see all the things that are possible. And then um, user view also has um, uh, some animation examples, or maybe it's examples. Yeah, so animation, you know, like here's another, this one's pretty cool. So yeah, um, I think that's going to be it. Uh, a lot of stuff you can do. I I think you you know you'll find that with with time and patience and careful math, you can make some interesting stuff. I think you'll also find that it's like if you if you check your computer's like activity monitor or whatever monitors the CPU usage, it's it's pretty easy to have your you know your computer working like 60, 70, 80, 90 percent capacity. Uh, screen refreshes can be pretty expensive. I guess, but you know, it's it's something.
and it's kind of fun to mess around. I, I use Super Collider for making animations for classes and lectures and things like that. Uh, and it's it can do a lot. So anyway, uh, so that's it for this week. And not too much in terms of concrete plans for uh, next week, which will be our final, final lecture. But I'm probably going to reach out to some of my uh, Illinois students um, you know, individually and just see what you're working on for your final projects. And if there's anything you want to see for this semester's last lecture, um, you know, let me know and we'll see what we can do. So I guess that's it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.